Hello, thank you for watching this talk on improved single round secure multiplication using regenerating codes. I am Daniel Escudero, and this is joint work with Mark Abspol, uh, Ivan Dangert, Ronald Kramer, and Chao Pingxing. So let me begin by describing what the setting we're studying here is. So our context is secure multiplication with secret sharing based MPC. So imagine you have n parties, p1, p2, up to pn, and they have two secret share values. We are denoting secret sharing by brackets of x and brackets of y, and, and the shares are x1 up to xn and y1 up to yn, respectively. Secret shared means, uh, um, I'm assuming background on secret sharing, but it basically means that each subset of at most uh, t parties cannot learn anything about the secret, and any subset of t plus one parties can completely determine the secret. And imagine they have these two share values. The goal in secure multiplication is essentially to obtain shares of the product of x times y, and the shares, um, I will denote them by z1 up to zn, and the idea is that the parties will engage in some kind of protocol, in some kind of uh, interaction, to be able to obtain these Z1, Z2 up to Zn so that they are sharings of the corresponding product of the two secrets. And in this context, in, in, in this work, we are in the honest majority setting. So we assuming, and, and we assume the maximal adversary. So we are assuming that N, the number of parties is equal to two T plus one, where T is the number of corruptions, which is also the, the threshold of the scheme. And um, we assume in our paper, we assume active security with the board but uh, for the purpose of the slides, I'm going to be talking mostly about passive security. So this is the sort of main problem that we're studying. And there are several different protocols to achieve this. So one of them, one of the oldest one is BGW. And in this protocol, we have two sharings. So we have X and Y, the inputs again are like X1 up to Y1, X1 up to Xn, the, the sharings of X, and Y1 up to Yn, the sharings of Y. And the first observation is that this uses Shamir secret sharing, which uses polynomials of degree um, at most t. And with this secret sharing scheme, if the parties locally multiply their shares, so x1 times y1, so p1 executes so x1 times y1, p2 similarly executes x2 times y2, up to pn, who executes, uh, who computes internally xn times yn. If the parties do this, then one can easily show that these are sharings of the product, but now under a different degree. So this is the first observation in BGW, and then, uh, because we don't want to have them with degree to t, we want to have them with degree t, we can execute the second step in which each party pi will essentially take its own share xi, yi, that computed in the previous step, and it will secret share it towards, towards all the other parties. So now all the parties have shares of degree t of each one of these individual shares. And because we know that these are sharings of degree to t, we know that there exist certain coefficients that I'm denoting here by lambda. There are certain coefficients so that if you take this linear combination of these shares, you get xy. This is just from the fact that the xi, yi are shares of x times y. And then, because we know that uh, such coefficients exist, and now we have shares of these individual sharings, then we can take the same linear combination down here, but now with sharings, and obtain sharings with the same degree of the product. And this is what is done in BGW. So um, this, is, this is a very old uh, uh, and traditional protocol, and the downside with this protocol is that the communication complexity is n square. Like, because every single party in this step, which are n, n of them, needs to distribute shares of this product. And there are n parties to distribute these shares to. So like this, this step will take a communication in total of roughly n square. The good thing is that it takes one round, though, because you only need to do this. The only interaction comes in this step, and it's just like one party sending a message to another party. So this is one of the first protocols, but then we also have a, a, a more updated, a more efficient approach, which is the Dangor-Nielsen protocol from crypto 2007. 
And this protocol, again, we start uh, with the observation that if you have shares of X and the parts have also shares of Y, then they can locally get shares with, with a higher degree, with degree to T, this is the same starting point, but instead of proceeding as before, what the parties will do is that they will assume some pre-processed data. This consists of pairs, uh, random values that are secret shared, both with degree T and also with degree 2T. So assuming this pre-processing, the parties can first locally compute this difference. So they take XY with degree 2T and they subtract from it R with degree 2T as well. And they obtain some value that we're calling E, also with degree 2T. And then each party PI sends this value to P1. The share of E is sent to P1. And then P1 will reconstruct E. It's fine for P1 to learn all this because even though P1 is not supposed to learn what the product is, it is being masked with R, so this leaks nothing sensitive to P1. And this is the first step, and the, or I mean the, the first interaction step. And then the second interactive step is that after P1 reconstructs E, P1 will send this value to all parties. Uh, and then after all the parties learned E, then they can, they can locally compute at E to the other part of, of, of the preprocessing to obtain shares of X times Y. So in a nutshell, what, what's happening here is that the parties are reconstructing this E value but to do so, they are first sending the shares to one single party, and this single party is sending the result to everyone. This way, the communication complexity is not n square because not everyone is talking to everyone. Uh, everyone is talking to just one single party who is replying back, so the communication complexity grows proportionally with n. So the communication complexity, as I mentioned, well, it goes with n, but the number of rounds now is two because there is one round to send all the single shares to P1, and then there is another round for P1 to send the value, the reconstructed value back. So much more efficient protocol, but now it has two rounds. So the question is, is the, the scenario, the panorama looks something like this. In terms of communication complexity, it, you, can have, you can have a very small communication complexity, in particular, it can be sub n square, it can be linear, in fact, as we just saw, with the DNO7 protocol, but then it would require more than one round, two to be concrete. And then the other approach is that maybe I want to have one round, but then you have to use the VGW protocol, which has a communication complexity of n squared. So this regime here is essentially unexplored. This what happens when we want to stick to one single round, but at the same time, we want to achieve a communication complexity that is better than the one from VGW, so, so better than n square. So can there exist one round secure multiplication protocols with sub-quadratic communication complexity? And even we, we may allow some pre-processing, just like DNO7 uses pre-processing, we may allow this. And this is the question we're looking at in this work. So can we find protocols like this? So the first, uh, the, the first idea towards solving the question is that there, there cannot exist such protocols if in the process of, of reconstruct in the process of getting the multiplication you need to open or reconstruct certain uh, uh, share values and this is easy because when everybody is supposed to learn a share value in one single round there is no other option than letting each party hear from at least t plus one parties because if a single party could learn a secret if by hearing uh, from less of this number of parties, then this party, will, uh, like an adversary corrupting T parties, will have known the secret to begin with. So if openings are part of your protocol, if somehow you need to open something and you have to stick to one round, then, then you have to go with the N squared. But in general, we don't know. We don't know if you really need to, to go the, uh, up to n square if you insist in one round. And in particular, I mean, this is the case because if you look at BGW, BGW is a protocol that does not use, the BGW protocol does not use openings. It uses a resharing, how it's called, and still takes n squared. So, so maybe every protocol will take n squared, even if it is, um, even if it is only, it doesn't use openings. So, this is a very interesting question, and 
I would like to motivate also, I mean, this is an interesting question on its own because most protocols seems to have this compromise, but it's also a very useful question. So minimizing the number of rounds is, is very well motivated, in, in especially in highly relevant, uh, especially in highly, in, in scenarios with high latency. Because these scenarios, you, you will spend a lot of time if you have to communicate back and forth, you want to minimize the number of rounds. It, it, it's okay if you maybe communicate a little bit more as long as you're minimizing the round count. So that's one motivation, but besides that, there are some protocols in the literature, most notably we have this protocol Fluid MPC that aims at tolerating dynamic participants so people can come and go. And in those protocols, you want to do things as uh, fast as possible in the sense that you don't want to have a lot of communication rounds. So every multiplication or every layer in the circuit hopefully takes you one single round. Because if you achieve this, then it means that you have a, a you can sort of transfer the state from one set of parties to the other set of parties, which is the setting they consider in their work. So in other words, in other words, if you have one round multiplication protocols, you can essentially plug and play, uh, uh, plug these protocols into works like this one that require one round multiplication protocols. So what are the results that we achieve in this work? Uh, in, in this uh, work, we actually make use of of a very interesting mathematical tool called regenerating codes in order to design a one round secure multiplication protocol. But unfortunately, we don't know how to do that exactly like that. We need to design such multiplication protocol for many multiplications at once. Uh, I was, I would be delighted to show a result that says we can, we, I give you a protocol for one single multiplication that is one round and only take, and takes less than N square communication, but we don't know how to do that. We don't even know if that's possible. But for many multiplications uh, in parallel, we can get a subquadratic communication complexity amortized per product. So of course, computing all these single products all together, they, will take, they, they may take uh, uh, more than n square, but when you amortize, divide by the number of products being uh, computed, then you get less uh, than quadratic. So this is the result we get in this work. And uh, to be more concrete with this, we present uh, an MPC protocol with the following characteristics. So first, it's going to be actively secure, and this is one of the big things that uh, it's one of the big problems because passive security is much easier than active. So moving to active requires some care. It, it considers the maximal adversary possible, which is uh, in the honest majority setting, which is uh, essentially n equal to two t plus one. If you go less than that, then you can start considering using pack secret sharing techniques that somehow can achieve this kind of result already. So the interesting case is, is, is the maximal adversary case. And then our protocol would evaluate a set of uh, uh, gates, or more generally, we generalize the circuit. So we evaluate a D-layer circuit, so a circuit with D-multiplicative layers. We evaluate not, not one of them, but actually logging copies of the same circuit. And we do it in essentially D rounds. D rounds, but with a little bit more that comes from the pre-processing, basically, and some check that must be done at the end. But uh, uh, essentially, D rounds, which uh, uh, um, um, is essentially one single round per multiplication layer, and each uh, gate, each multiplication gate of each instance is going to take sub-quadratic communication. And what I would like to stress that this is the first application of regenerating codes in the context of MPC which is something that uh, the community has been looking at for a while, like how to get uh, this type of regenerating codes to help applications in MPC. And it, it was not possible to design one of those until recently. So let me give you an idea about why are regenerating codes useful. So let's begin with this diagram. Imagine we have a secret S, and this secret is secret shared into, well, shares of S. Uh, let's call them as one, as two, and as n, and then the dealer, whoever is dealing these values, is going to distribute these values to p1, p2, up to pn. So this is the, the, the sharing phase. So imagine this is this is the, the beginning. This is the first one of the first stages, and then later on, eventually, you want to reconstruct this data. Imagine I don't know, you are storing a file among multiple nodes, and then later on, you want to retrieve this file. So then, what you do later on is that, well, all these uh, parties will send the shares to whoever needs them, and all the shares together with, will determine the, the secret S. 
but actually only t plus one of them suffice because it's a threshold secret sharing scheme less than t shares don't, don't tell you anything about the secret but t plus one will completely determine the secret so so many of these parties don't need to send a message only t plus one need to send a message so what is the the goal with regenerating codes or what's the deal with them so it's the same setting as before except that this time instead of P1 sending the whole S1 for reconstruction is going to send, is going to apply a function to S1 first before sending it. And the idea is that maybe now we need all the N shares, like instead of taking a subset of them, we, we, we will need all of them. But each mu i, as denoted here, will be a compression function. So down here you can see that each mu i takes elements in a big field and they return element in a small field. So these mu i's here that I'm showing up here, they are all reduction functions. They take something bigger and, and they turn it to something smaller. So overall, this is better than before because then you have like, sure, everyone is talking now, but the amount of data they're sending is way smaller. So this is regenerating codes in the context of secret sharing. And they're very useful because we can use them for, for example, it, reducing the amount of communication in distributed storage applications uh, and things like that where secret sharing is used in a somehow static manner. But when you want to have some computation over secret share values, just like the task we have at hand, uh, which is secure multiplication, it is not clear how to use regenerating codes for anything. And I would like to highlight why this is the case. What is the challenging thing? Because they look very useful. So, so let's begin by I mean, I don't know, brainstorming a bit and, and mentioning how they could be useful in principle. So how could they be useful? It, it, the main problem they have, I mean, they, they can be useful for MPC, of course, by, by helping you reconstruct values, right? So, so for example, in the context of, in the, context of the, the N07 protocol, we saw that one of the main uh, steps that need to be carried out in this protocol, which I'm going to mention here again. So one of the main steps that we need to carry out here is that each party PI will send the share EI to P1. So maybe one of the thoughts could be, well, well, why not using regenerating codes here so that this share goes in a reduced form or like compressed form to P1. So P1 needs to receive less data. This sounds promising, but then one of the problems with this approach is that um, this computation requires, using regenerating codes requires us to go to a, to a larger field, a, a field, that, an extension field that has roughly a, an extension degree of log n, where n is the number of parties. And in computations, in concrete context, we want to operate, sure, maybe over a finite field, but of constant degree. Uh, we don't, we, of constant size. We, we don't want to have a degree or, or a, like a, like in a structure that grows with the number of parties because typically your application is fixed and then you want more parties on top. It's not like you decide your application based on the number of parties. So so this is one of the main drawbacks of a, a regenerating codes that they, they simply don't work over a, a constant size field. They really require you to go to a to an extension field that is that grows with the number of parties. But then but then they're still useful because a, a solution for this is that well, maybe you want your computation to be over FPZ, which is a constant size field. You can embed this structure into FPM, which is the one you can use regenerating codes over. Uh, well, and you use regenerating codes uh, here to uh, avoid the overhead in M. So basically, it's like you do MPC here, but your application is over here. So um, you use the regenerating codes so that every time that you are supposed to reconstruct something here, instead of, of sending a big element, you send a, a smaller element in the, in the smaller ring, in the smaller field. And it's true regenerating codes can help in that direction, but then, I mean, the, the issue is that we already know how to solve this without going to regenerating codes. And I want to show it very slightly here, like very, very simple. How is that you can do it? So this issue can be already avoided without the need of re regenerating codes. What issue am I talking again? I, I, I want to stress it is the, is if you're doing MPC over FP to the M, how do you uh, sort of avoid the overhead in terms of M? 
if you want to compute over a fixed size uh, field. So this can be already avoided. And, and to give you an idea is that we can also use a different type of reconstruction functions that are like compressing functions that still allows a party to retrieve a, a, um, the secret, which is assumed to be in the subfield without the need of using regenerating codes. And these compression functions can be given by this, for example. So um, the compression function uh, rho, uh, rho i can be given by the projection into the small field of the appropriate Lagrange coefficient multiplied by, by, by the input. So basically what this is doing is that every party is locally multiplying the Lagrange coefficient corresponding to its own share. But then instead of sending this whole big field element, they are just sending the, let's say, the, the first coordinate, which is the one corresponding to the small field, uh, corresponding to the, to the domain you are computing over. So you can check that if you sum all these values, then this is the same as projecting over the sum of these guys. And this guy here inside, because of Shamir's secret sharing, is just the secret. And this is the main trick. The, the trick is that your secret, sure, it belongs to the big field, but more than that, it belongs to the small field because we chose it to be like that. The secrets are, even though the computation could happen in principle over the big field, it's actually happening over the small field. So, so it means that projecting S into the first coordinate, it gives you the same S. And this is like why this trick works. It's because uh, this element could be very, this element here could be very large but it's actually very small. It's just a, a one coordinate. So we could already have solved this problem, as I mentioned, without the help of regenerating codes, which is, is a shame because we wanted to, to apply them. And the main observation is that we can actually use them because the, unlike the previous compressing functions that I mentioned, regenerating codes enable the reconstruction of the full S instead of reconstructing just the projection. So here you can see that we've reconstructed the projection and the projection happens to coincide with S because S belongs to the small field. But what if we take S to belong to, this, to the big field? So now suddenly these regenerating codes enable the reconstruction not of P of S, uh, which is, is an element of, of uh, the small field and may lose a lot of information, it will actually enable the reconstruction of the whole S, which is, is, is a much bigger element. It has like a, a factor of M over C size uh, bigger. So this is the observation that regenerating codes can be useful for, is that they enable us to reconstruct big elements with little communication, not only small elements. So we basically use regenerating codes to optimize secure multiplication over this extension ring. So now we get like fast multiplication, but over this big ring. But again, this is a problem because this big ring is not very interesting because we're interested in computation over constant size ring. But it, well, it turns out that because FQ to the M is essentially as, as vector spaces are, is the same as, as M, as M copies of FQ. With the help of a, of a very interesting tool called reverse multiplication friendly embeddings, we can actually turn this multiplication protocol over extension fields into a protocol to multiply essentially m copies of the same uh, m multiplications over the small field. So this is very 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 interesting because at the end of the day, it shows that sure you can use multiplication you obtain multiplication over here with the help of regenerating codes. And that's not very useful on its own unless by using these RMFEs, we can turn it into several multiplications of FQ. And this is indeed what we do. So this is the main result in terms of MPC. We obtain a lot of multiplications, each one of them having less than N squared com uh, communication and uh, taking exactly one round. And this is with the help of regenerating codes. I want to emphasize that if you don't care about if you didn't care about reconstructing the whole value, you could follow this approach uh, back here, which is very interesting, but, and it doesn't have the overhead in terms of M, but the communication complexity will be still N square in terms of the size of the thing you're reconstructing. So it's, it's not uh, useful for our problem.
So what are the challenges that we face in this work? Um, there are, there are uh, uh, the main challenge is that we want to keep the number of rounds uh, bounded by one, so exactly equal to one. And there are several issues with this. One is that the use of RMFEs, as traditionally used, will introduce an additional round to do something called re-encoding. And this is very bad for us because we really don't want to have this overhead. We want to stick to one single round. So to address this, we will introduce a novel encoding method that removes the need of having an extra round. And this is of I independent interest because it also applies to previous works that have used RMFEs. The second challenge is that in terms of active security, you need to ensure, uh, you need to do some broadcast in every single round. And well, if you want to avoid doing broadcast in every single round, you can always just check that all the values broadcasts were correct at the end of the protocol. But then sometimes, and we showed that if we do these things naively, then this will be the case. Sometimes this will introduce some attack vectors. So to, uh, to avoid this, we make a novel use of uh, function dependent preprocessing. And we show that this will alleviate this issue. This is a novel use of this type of preprocessing. It has been used in the literature before for uh, optimizing the communication count. So dividing by two, essentially, the amount of elements sent. But, but the idea is that here we can also not use it. We can also use it not only for efficiency purposes, but also for security purposes. And finally, we also have like a, a, some notable contributions to the theory of regenerating codes. In particular, we provide a new characterization of uh, what a regenerating code, uh, like when is a code regenerating, basically, in terms of certain properties of its dual. So that's like the first interesting result. But then other, also very interestingly, we generalize all this theory that exists already for the case of uh, finite fields, and we generalize it to something called Galois rings, which are um, a generalization of integers modulated to decay. Uh, in particular, as I mentioned, because it's a generalization of these rings, um, this type of rings already include that case, which is very interesting in practice because it is computation model, for example, 2 to the 64 or 2 to the 128, which is more compatible with uh, modern ha hardware. So these are contributions in terms of the theory of regenerating codes. Now, in what follows, I want to give you an idea about how is that uh, um, we get our results. So first, I'm going to go over the definition of regenerating codes over Galois rings. So um, we're going to consider throughout the, the rest of the talk two Galois rings. So um, S is going to be a Galois ring of um, integers modulo, an extension ring of the integers modulo P to the K of degree L. This is the degree. And the second one, R, is going to be a Galois ring also with the same base ring but now is going to have a, a degree extension m times l, which means that r can be seen as an extension of s of degree the extra factor here, sort of the extra factor here, which is m. So a Galois ring is, if you're not familiar with it, is just polynomials over this base ring, integers modulo p to the k, being, uh, uh, it's just like polynomials, but you take modulo some irreducible polynomial of degree l. It's literally the same if k is equal to one, this literally boils down to f p to the l or the Galois field with p to the l elements. So it's a generalization of that for k greater than one. It's in, in general, that's not a field, but it's still a local ring that has very nice properties. Okay, and, and we start by taking a c to be an r sub module of r to the n plus one. That is literally another way of describing a secret sharing scheme. Elements in C are just vectors with n plus one entries. The first one will act as the secret and the other ones will act as the shares. So this is just an alternative way of describing a secret sharing scheme. It's very well known that there is a duality or like a, a relation between a codes and linear secret sharing schemes. So let's begin by defining what this regenerating property I've been mentioning all this time uh, consists of. So, C, which can be seen as a secret sharing scheme or as a code, has linear repair over S if, if there exist S linear maps phi of i that map from the big ring to the small ring, and also some scalars in the big ring, such that whenever you have a, a big vector, 
in the in the Galois ring, uh, sorry, in the code, then you can essentially reconstruct the first coordinate of this vector by taking a linear combination with the scalars zi of the compressed uh, coordinates, uh, the other coordinates of the vector. So, so the vector is x0, x1, up to xn, and we can essentially reconstruct x0 by taking a linear combination of the other coordinates, but without taking the full coordinates, but actually some compressed version of those coordinates. We see that this value here belongs to r, but these values here, they all belong to s, so they're smaller than r. So this is a, a regenerating code with linear repair a, a, in the first coordinate. It's called repairable code or also regenerating. I use the two terms indistinguishably during this talk. So one of our results will actually show that there exists a repairing or regenerating code a, of R over S and it's based essentially on Shamir secret sharing. So it's essentially, it's literally Shamir secret sharing. A, a, um, assuming that certain inequality holds in terms of L and M. So basically what this is saying is that L, L is going to be constant because it's just the, the, the base ring over which, one, uh, over which we want to have the computation. And M here, after we apply this inequality, basically it turns out that M is going to be something like log N. So think of M as, as something, M, M is, remember is the degree extension of R over S, so R is essentially M copies of S as, as modules, and uh, M is going to be sized roughly log N. And again, because it, it's a code, we can naturally use this as a secret sharing scheme, uh, and the regenerating or the repairing property will be used to simplify and make a more efficient the reconstruction of a given secret. This is exactly what I just mentioned. So, so the repairing property enables a very efficient one round reconstruction. If you have a shared secret, then each party PI will send the compressed version of its own share to all the parties. Remember that this is in the small ring and not in the big ring. And then the parties will compute this linear combination, which is the one that uh, we had from, from before. So is the, because of the properties of a repairing code, this linear combination here will give you the secret back. I insist this belongs to R, this belongs to R, but this belongs to S. So this is one of the main results we obtained, like you can get such a, such a type of regenerating property from Shamir secret sharing over Galois rings. It was already known that you can get it for uh, fields, but now we also can get it over Galois rings. And how do we use them? So I want to guide you through our protocol about how is that you can use regenerating codes to obtain multiplication in one single round. So let's begin by reviewing what Bieber-based multiplication or triple-based multiplication is. This is the, the, the standard protocol that we typically use when we want to multiply two values. So given two shared values, we want to compute the product. So it happens in three stages. The first one is just pre-processing, so I call it the phase zero, where the parties compute a triple A, B, and C, where C is supposed to be the, the product of A and B, and, and A and B are random. In the first actual step, in the first interaction, the parties will reconstruct the difference between X, the actual input they want to compute over, and A, the value from the pre-processing. And they reconstruct this value, which leaves nothing because A is random. And in this reconstruction, it happens in one round because we use this reconstruction with, where everybody just announced their share to everybody, actually their compressed share. Similarly, the parties open E, which is the difference between Y and B. Then in the final step, the parties compute locally this linear combination here on the right, which you can check very easily. It actually leads to the shares of X times Y. So this is a very standard protocol. And here we're gonna use a, a regenerating codes. So the communication costs are the following. So if you if you if you take into account how many elements are being sent here, they send O of n squared elements in S, which are the compressed shares, right? So so normally it would be n squared elements of R, but because they are compressing before sending is n squared elements of S. 
And when you count that in terms of how many elements of R they're sending around, because remember, R is going to be the same as M copies of S, this is the same as dividing by M here. So, so basically, in terms of how many elements of R are being sent, we get something like n squared divided by log n, which is sub n squared. So um, it's, we break the barrier of the quadratic communication complexity by a log n factor, which is not very big, but it really breaks the barrier, which is a very interesting result, in terms of the, uh, of the count of elements over R. This is fine, and this is a very interesting result already, but the main drawback is that, as we know, as I, as I already mentioned several times, we are not interested in having computation over R, we're interested in having computation over S. So let's, let's continue. So, so this is exactly what I mentioned. We want MPC over S, not over R. But the intuition that we want to, to, to have is that S will be equivalent to many copies of, uh, of R. As I mentioned before, S can be embedded into R, the same as, as in the case of fields, FPC, as I was mentioning, it, uh, uh, I was referring to it, can be embedded into FPM, but then all the efficiency benefits are lost if we use this, because at the end of the day, we will be communicating against square elements of S. And we want to communicate, if, if this is your domain of multiplication, then you will essentially be operating, on sending N square elements of your domain. We want to send less than that. So what we do, uh, is that we identify that this is not a new problem, actually. And to illustrate why this is the case, we take this as an example. So Shamir secret sharing, as, as we know it, it does not work over F2, for example, because F2 is very small. It doesn't have enough elements to allow for interpolation. So what people typically do is that they take a field extension uh, of degree, well, coincidentally, also log n, and now we use this extension instead, and again, we embed F2 into F2 to the M. Now, at first glance, uh, we notice that this is very wasteful, once again, because we have this overhead in M. So there is this very interesting work, uh, CCXY19, of Cascudo et al. Crypto 18. Uh, yeah, it should be 18 here, my apologies. So there is this very interesting work uh, that shows that sh shows the following like intuitively f2 to the m is the same as well m copies of f2 so if we are computing over f2 to the m it sounds i mean every element here is like a vector and it has m entries and before we were using only this entry and now the others were completely wasted so because we have so many entries in these long vectors we can hope to actually make use of all the individual entries to run one computation in all of them. So that's like the intuition. The problem with this intuition is that even though these two uh, 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 algebraic structures are isomorphic, they are isomorphic as vector spaces. And what we would like to do over this space here, which are vectors, is to multiply pointwise, right? We want, we want to execute a computation over each coordinate, so we have to add pointwise. And adding is easy because vector spaces addition are, uh, are pointwise, but vector spaces don't, don't even have a, a multiplication notion. So this isomorphism here does not help towards getting what we want. But the solution from this work that we're citing here is that we can use the so-called reverse multiplication friendly embeddings, which are very interesting tools. Essentially, it's a pair of, of, of linear morphisms, psi and phi, such that, well, C maps from F2 to the M to F2 to the D, and, and you can think of M as being very close to D. For, for illustration purposes, I just think it's the same, although it, it's not, and it cannot be the same, but let's think for a moment about that. And we have these two maps, and the two maps satisfy that, well, maybe you cannot get the, the component-wise product of two vectors directly, but you can first map the two vectors with phi, that gives you two field extension elements o o over F2 to the M, and now you can map them back with uh, psi, and it turns out because of the properties of these two functions, that will give you the, the component-wise product. How can they be used? So in CCXY19, 
they are used in the following way. Uh, oh, before I get into that, I'm sorry, I want to stress that the ratio m divided by d it can actually be shown to approach a, a constant. And in our case, we are not dealing with fields, we're dealing with Galois rings, but recent work at crypto uh, this year, crypto 21, actually showed that we can also get our RMFEs over Galois rings. So that's not really a problem. So in CCXY19, uh, the protocol operates as follows. So to secret share a value, I'm, I'm going to stick to the field extensions just for, because that's how this original work is, is described. And I insist, I'm sorry, it's CCXY18. Uh, to secret share one of these vectors, they will secret share over F2 to the, um, this vector here actually lives in F2 to the D. And when they want to secret share it, they actually do secret sharing of the image under phi of this vector, which is an element of F2 to the M. And this is secret sharing over F2 to the M, as we know it, that can be made to work. Let's say it's Shamir secret sharing. If you want to add two values, then it's easy because phi is additive or homomorphic. If you want to multiply, then it gets a little bit more tricky because in multiplication, you want to essentially obtain shares of the product, component-wise product of X and Y. But the component-wise product of X and Y, having shares of it means that you have shares over F2 to the M of the image under phi of exactly that product. So, so that's why we want to get shares of phi of the component-wise product. How do we get it? They get it in two steps. So um, in the first step, the parties execute whatever protocol they come up with over F2 to the M to compute the product of these two secrets. And that's like, there are many protocols. We can use, for example, the triple base protocol I just mentioned. And now they got this. Now, however, this is not enough because phi of X times phi of Y may not be equal. And in fact, it's in general, it's in general not equal to the, to the thing we want, which is the image of the component waste product. So to address this, they use MPC like another small protocol, but it requires interaction to apply this map, this composition. It's a map that takes elements of F2 to the M into elements of F2 to the M. And they take this and apply tau to it. So they take this value and apply tau to it. Again, this is an interactive protocol. They, they have some interaction. And then they get this. And I claim that this is exactly equal to what we want. And this is easy to see if you essentially apply, use the definition of tau. Tau is just this composition and then use the properties of a reverse multiplication friendly embeddings that tell you that whenever you have C of two products of phi functions, then you get the arguments multiplied pointwise. So this is CCXY in a nutshell. Now, can we use this protocol for our goals or what we want here? And the answer is no. This protocol will not work in our setting directly, like not out of the box, because applying this extra function, this function tau will add an extra round. I insist, I want to emphasize, we need to stick to one round multiplication. So even though this multiplication up here can be done in one round, this thing down here will require an extra round. And we don't want to do that. This is why in this work, we introduce an additional contribution, which is that we encode values differently. So this is very important. Now, if you want to secret share a vector over SD, so now I'm coming back to our Galois rings. Remember, S is a Galois ring of P to the K. L is, is like a constant element. You can think of it as the anal analogous of FPC. And here you have R actually FPL, to be concrete. And here you have a R that is P to the K M L, which is the analogous to FP to the M. So it's a, it's a, it's a R is an extension of S of degree M. So if you want to secret share a vector here, we, if, if in the previous context, you just apply phi to that vector that gives you an element of R, and then you do secret sharing over R of that vector. Now, instead, we're going to find some X 
such that x under the function psi gives you the vector x that you are interested in sharing, and this is the small x that we're going to that we're going to a, a secret share. So this is the new type of sharing or the new type of encoding. To encode a vector x, we encode instead of mapping through phi, we encode with a preimage of under psi. And by the way, you can always show that you can show by the properties of RMFE is that C is going to be surjective. So you can show that addition is still local um, because of the linearity of, of C. So I will just skip this quickly, but multiplication in one round can be done also uh, quite fast in, with, with very good communication. So it works like this. We assume that we're gonna have now a more complex multiplication triple as pre-processing uh, of this form. And with this at hand, if you have X and you have Y, which you want to multiply, so, so the corresponding vectors encoded by them are just the images on the PSI. With the goal is to obtain shares of the product, which means shares of a value such that when you map it under PSI, you get uh, uh, the original two vectors, uh, the component voice product of the two vectors. And to do this, we just need to execute two rounds. The first one, uh, the part is open x minus a, and also y minus b, just like with normal uh, beaver-based multiplication. And here we use regenerating codes. So this one is very efficient. It only involves n squared divided by m, so divided n squared divided by log n elements. And then the parties compute locally this expression here, which is essentially the Bieber-based multiplication expression, but now with taus. Uh, so this is essentially what they, this is all data from the preprocessing, and they get this. You can check that it's equal to this. Now, I claim that this is the z we can take. So in other words, I claim that if we take z to be this value, then when we map the z through, through psi, we get what we want, which is the component voice product. This is true because this is the same as psi of these two things. And remember, because of the properties of RMFEs, psi of a product under phi, of a product of phi's, is the same as the component voice product of the arguments of the phi. And well, the arguments in this case are psi of x, which is vector x by definition, p of y, which is vector y by definition, so this gives you the component voice product. So this novel method of encoding really uh, rules out or removes the issue of having to apply tau after the multiplication has been done. So basically you can apply tau at the same time as you do the computation, if you will. Now I also want to note that our new encoding improves CCXY in, in other, uh, like, on its own, like this encoding is not only useful for a work, but also for CCXY, which I'm sorry, I insist is CCXY 18. So the extra re-encoding round is removed, as I mentioned. So, so this can also be, uh, our encoding can also be applied to CCXY to remove the re-encoding over there. And also there is this annoying thing at the beginning, which is a um, subspace check uh, for the input phase that verifies that the input is in, in the right subspace. Well, here you don't need that because every secret sharing is, is a possible sharing of a vector. In the previous case, only the, the elements in the image of phi can be correct encodings. So now here, everyone can be an encoding which uh, removes this problem. There are several additional challenges, specifically when we move to active security in our protocol. You need to deal with the correctness of, of the openings because the Regenerating codes don't give you any redundancy. And you also need to deal with um, the consistency of the broadcast and so on. We use function-dependent preprocessing to address this in a novel way. And we leave the details uh, for you to check in the, in the paper, but like it's very interesting that we can solve it that way. And then finally, I just want to revisit in one single slide the, um, <clears throat> the results on regenerating codes. These are not so important to understand in detail. I just want to mention that. We have this new characterization of what it means to have repairing ability in terms of uh, the dual code. That can be interesting on its own. And then we also have an existing theorem on repairing codes with Shamir secret sharing. So basically, to be concrete, the function that you take is, is a trace function with um, the generalized trace function over Galois rings, where the alpha is are some evaluation points that you need to 
take very carefully as powers of certain a, a root of unity, and also the weights are, are the the Ws are the weights coming from the dual code of of Reed Solomon codes, and this is similar to the result over fields, but it has several crucial differences. For example, the trace function is to be defined differently or or more in a more generalized way, and also the evalu evaluation points need to be taken in a very careful manner because otherwise this won't work. So there are several differences uh, that are very interesting. Um, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, you stick with me all this time, so I appreciate that you um, were in this talk. Thank you so much. <laughs>